boiled church down to being the tradition of men. Amen. We reduce church. Hallelujah. When you understand that you are the church, then you'll understand that there's so much more in store for the church. But we have to be a unified body of believers. We have to have one mind, one faith, one heart. Amen. That means to be on one accord. You know, the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 that when the apostles were up in the upper room, they were all on one accord. They didn't have no political agenda. They didn't have no hatred. They didn't have no malice. They didn't have no kind of uh, self-ambitions. They just want to glorify God. Hallelujah. They just wanted to glorify God. And because they were all on one accord, the Bible said that was the entrance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only shows up where the people are all on one accord. And being on one accord simply means that we all have the same agenda. We all have the same agenda. There are no hidden agendas. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you've been here for a number of years, you understand that everything that we do here is transparent. Amen. There, there's nothing that is hidden. There's nothing that is in the corner. Amen. Everything is open. And it's open not only so that we can be transparent, but so that you will have a, a level opportunity to make your decisions concerning how you're going to operate in the ministry. Amen. Because we need everybody to be on one accord. Amen. We need everybody to be on one accord. We've been operating uh, in discord for so long. And we've been working hard trying to come on one accord. But you can't do it without God. You can't do it without God. You can't, you can't get yourself together. How many of y'all try to get your own life together? Amen. I tried. I tried. You tried. We tried to get our own life together. We had a picture of what we wanted. We had an idea of what we wanted. We even had a, a somewhat of a plan on how we were going to obtain it. And that's a good thing. But whenever those things alleviate God, then you never really accomplish your mission. Some folks you say, well, how that's working for you? Amen. How that working for you? Try to do it on your own. As a corporate body of believers, we have to be together so that we can all benefit. Amen. Amen. I don't benefit if I only seek myself. If I was up here every Sunday and I'm preaching on tithing and giving and tithing and giving and tithing and giving. And every time we come into prayer, we got a giving offering. And every time we come to Bible study, we got a giving offering. And every time the kids come to rehearsal, they got a giving offering. If I'm up here and I'm working you out of all your money because I'm going to lose that land. That ain't blessing you none, is it? Oh, I'm going to tell you it is. I'm going to tell you whether the Lord said, if you give it, if you give it back to you, good man, the first I'll take you down and run it over God will cause me to give it to you. Oh, I'm going to read the scripture. Amen. And all of that is true. And all of it is valid. And all of it is biblical. But because my heart ain't right, because I have a hidden agenda. My agenda is to get me a new Cadillac. That's my agenda. So I'm going to utilize the word of God in order to persuade you to give to my cause. Now, if we all have one common agenda, and that is to win souls into the kingdom, our common agenda should be in order to get people into the kingdom. So whatever we're doing, it should be towards that, right? In doing that, you, that's how you get blessed. If you listen, if you stick to what God called for you to do, you're going to get what it is that you so desire. That's why the Bible says in the Book of Matthew, chapter six, verse thirty-three: "Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you." When you see God first in his righteousness, not your own. 
It's all about being on one accord. If you look at an orchestra, if you've ever been to a, 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 a concert, usually you have the percussion session, you have the horn session, you have the, you know, the symbol, you have all these different sections in the in an orchestra. And they they sound out of tune in the beginning. You know, you got the horn going, and, and, and you got the violin going, and they all ain't nobody on one accord. But then all of a sudden, this man or this woman walks out and they step at this podium and they tap on it. He lifts his hands in the air and he begins. And next thing you know, everybody that was in discord are now on one accord and they are in harmony together. That's the same way God wants the church. Because although we all live our different lives, we go to different aspects of our lives, we all still should have one thing and that's to be on one accord so that we can be in tune with the Holy Spirit so we can be led by the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish the Spirit's will. And if we can accomplish the Spirit's will, then we benefit from it. The Bible says, muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn. When, when, when it talks about muzzling, not to muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, in biblical times, they would have the ox tied to a stone wheel, and the ox would walk around the stone wheel, and he would, would grind the corn into meal. And because they didn't want the ox to eat the meal, they put a muzzle on it. But the Bible said, don't muzzle that ox. Let that ox live off of what he's working for. Well, they use that scripture in reference to the pastors because the Bible says that the church is supposed to take care of me. Then I tell you what's biblical. It is your responsibility to take care of me. All right? I know y'all sitting there looking at me like I didn't know this. Okay? So what the Bible is saying, don't stop me from eating off the tithes and the offerings that you bring into the God, into God's house. That's how I'm supposed to feed my family. That's how I'm supposed to pay my bills. And not only do I pay my bills by giving your tithes, but I got to take 10% of what I get, and I too got to pay tithes. Understand? So it's not like that you're just doing this all, and I'm not getting nothing, or, or you're not getting nothing. You get blessed from being obedient to God. I get blessed from being obedient to God. And when we're all obedient to God, it works out for everybody. Understand? Most of you know that I'm a mechanic by nature. If your alternator in your car ain't working, you ain't going nowhere. But if the alternator is working and the battery ain't working, you ain't going nowhere. If the alternator and the battery is working well, but the solder ain't working, you ain't going nowhere. Your ignition system needs all three of them working together in unison in order for you to go somewhere. We have to come on one accord as the church if we want to be effective in the kingdom of God. And when I say effective, that means that we want to make our coming to not be in vain. Our coming to church should be the place to where we can exercise the things that God has told us. He told us to love. The Bible said that God is love. That means that it is his nature. To love. You know what nature is. It, it's just something that you do. It, it, it's just something you do. It reminds me of a story about a man. He, he walked up on a snake and, and it, it, it was kind of cold outside and the snake was, was, was shivering. And the man, when he walked up on the snake, he, he looked at the snake. He said, Snake, you sure look cold. And the snake said, I am cold. I am cold. He said, If you just put me inside your coat and let me warm up, he said, I'll be all right. The man said, okay, then I'll put you inside my coat, but you got to promise me that you won't bite me. Okay? So they said, I promise. I ain't going to bite you. I ain't going to bite you. I promise. But well, the man picked up the snake and put the snake inside his coat. And when the snake got warm, all of a sudden the snake bit the man. And the man fell. I said, I thought you said you weren't going to bite me. The snake said, what you thought? I'm a snake. It's my nature. It's my nature to bite you. See, when you are who you are, then you do it because it is your nature. The Bible says that praise 
is common among the people of God. It is our nature to praise God. The song that the children just sang, every breath is in our lungs. It is our nature to praise God. He says in the book of Psalms 150, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. All right? It's all about being in one accord and being obedient. One accord with what? One accord with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always in agreement on everything. They are never in disagreement, always in agreement. Even when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist down at the Jordan River, the Bible says that Jesus, the Son of God, was in the water being baptized by John the Baptist, and God the Father opened up heaven and spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. And God the Spirit descended down upon him like a dove in bodily form. All three was in agreement with what Jesus had to do. If we can understand the Trinity, if we can understand how they operate in concert to one another, then we'll understand the power that we have when we come into concert with one another. The Bible said, where there's two or three touching together in agreement. He said, I'll be in the midst. That's why it's always good to find somebody who's praying to pray with you. Because we can touch and we can agree. And if we touch and if we agree and God is in the midst, then whatever we have an issue with, it's going to be delivered. Not because of something that we said, but because of what he said. It only works because of what God said. This word only works because God said it. I can see now it's going to be kind of hard. All that praise and worship. The Holy Spirit done set the atmosphere. I'm going to try to give you this word. Amen. Transformation. I think about the word transformation. You talk about a metamorphosis. You talk about change, too. Change. To transform means to change. You change from one thing to another. Before you got saved, you was a sinner. You was an enemy of the cross. When you surrendered your life to Christ, he transformed you. And he gave you new life. I didn't like me. When I finally came into my new life and I was able to turn around and look at my old life, I didn't like me. I didn't like the me I used to be. He let me see who he says I am, and I am well pleased with that. But it takes work. It takes work on my part. See, most of us, we want to just wait on God to do everything. You, 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 there's some things you got to do. You got to make a decision. I don't care what you're going through. You got to make you got to make the decision that you're going to stay in the righteousness of God. You got to make the decision that that I'm going to live holy. You got to make the decision that I'm going to come to church. You got to make the decision that I'm going to read my word. You got to make the and to make the decision based on your love for God, not for nobody else. You got to decide that you want to be on the praise team because you want to be on the praise team because you love God. You got to decide that you want to be a musician or you want to be an usher because you love God. Yeah. Not because someone has coerced you right. into doing it. Right. Amen. Amen. Because even if you do it when someone coerces you to do it, you've been robbed of your blessings. Right. Only what we do for God will last. Right. So we had to be transformed. Come as you are, the Bible says. Let whosoever will, let them come and take up the waters of life freely. Whoever he is, God said, let them come. Let them come just as they are. Come on now. He said, let the sinners come. He said, I didn't come to save those who are whole. I come to save the sinners. Yeah. Our calling is to help sinners get into the kingdom of God, or at least get them in a position where God can deal with them. That's our calling. That's the church's calling. We've been transformed so that the sinner can see what it is that they're going to be transformed to and have a desire for it. I'm going to take my time. I, I spent a lot of time, you know, we, it, it, uh, we're going to praise the worship, but I'm going to take my time to work. To die for. I, I thought about this scripture. Uh, 
in this sermon, I thought about baptism. Baptism. Let's go to the word of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Keep in mind, we talked about transformation, baptism. Matthew chapter 28. Hallelujah. Verse 19. We didn't get to say amen. Baptism, baptism. It's funny that God would use the word or the Greek word baptizo. Baptism means baptizo in the Greek. And it means to immerse. It means to immerse. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all came on one accord during the baptism of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, the Son of Man. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was together. Now, I said it, it's ironic that the Lord would use the word baptizo for to describe this unifying experience. It's a unifying experience where they come together. Amen. Let's look at verse 19. It says, uh, we'll start at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now he's going to give his disciples instructions. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. During Jesus' baptism, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was present. He says that I'm going to be present with every blood-washed believer that is baptized. Now, before you think on that too much, because we have our old traditional minds that begin to think about the baptism and what we've been taught in churches down through the years, it's going to be a little bit different than what you hear today. Right. Amen. Some people say you can't be saved unless you've been baptized. He said, salvation is to be eternally with Christ. Amen. Amen. But as I think back over the scriptures, and I remember there were two thieves on the cross with Jesus. And one thief ridiculed Jesus and mocked him and said, if you be the son of God, then get yourself down off the cross and why you had to get up down too. The other thief said, shut up your mouth, man. This is my paraphrase. Now shut up your mouth. You and I, we deserve this. But this man ain't did nothing to deserve this. He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Jesus said, today, he said tomorrow or next week, he said, today, you will be with me in paradise. I don't remember reading nowhere where that man got baptized. Hello. I, I, I don't remember reading nowhere where he got baptized. Baptism is essential to the Christian. All right? But it, it's not essential to get into heaven. The Bible says if there be any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let the elders among their heads and oil, pray, 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 and they shall be saved, and God will raise them up. This was given to people who are on their sick beds, who never knew Christ. But because they still have breath in their body, if you have an elder that can go there and can introduce them to Christ and they accept Christ, then that person is saved. Never been baptized. See, when we talk about church, we talk about the tradition of men, it's too many holes in the tradition of men. That's why you got to hold fast the sound doctrine. Amen. 
Let's go to Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 23 real quick. A couple books over. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. You're already in Matthew 28. Let's go two books over. You'll be in Luke. Thank you, Jesus. Beginning at verse 21, we'll read down to verse 23. And you get to say amen. This is Jesus' baptism. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended as he was praying. As he was praying. As he was praying. Heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended as he was praying. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And the scripture said, now Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. But you see what he had to go through before he was able to begin his ministry. Jesus had to unify with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before he could begin his ministry. That's why it always blows my mind when I see people who they have a ministry or they say they have a ministry, but they're not attached to anybody. You, you know these folks that run around and, you know, they ain't, they ain't attached to nobody's church. They, ain't, they, they, they don't have no local assembly nowhere, but they call themselves apostles, evangelists, they they, they're out there, they, they're preaching the gospel, they, they said, but when they left on themselves, there's too many holes in it. The reason why we are one accord, so that we can all have the same mind. The reason why I give you the word out of the scriptures is so that there can be no holes poking. So that we can all have the same thinking, the same teaching. We went from King James to the NIV so that we can all have the same Bible. So we're all reading the same word so that we're all getting the same understanding. Now, of course, you have those rebellious ones that want to get their own understanding, and that's fine. Well, the Bible says, uh, acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and lean not to your own understanding. Yeah, but you have those ones who want to lean to their own understanding, and there's nothing you can do about those people. Amen. The only thing you can do about those people is pray for them. Because those are usually ones that will detach themselves from a local body and go out there and say that I'm this and I'm that there, and they, they, they're not attached to no one. One of the most powerful speakers in the world, uh, her name was Juanita Bynum. How many of y'all heard of Juanita Bynum? Powerful woman of God. Amen. I remember seeing her one time in conference, and she said, I don't care what I'm doing or what part of the country I'm in. Saturday night, I'm flying back to Atlanta because I got to be at my own church. She was only powerful because she was tethered to someone else. Understand? She was tethered to a body of like-minded believers who was praying for her, who was encouraging her, who was supporting her. Jesus had to unify with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when I say Jesus, I'm talking about the Son of Man. Because the Bible says he's the Son of Man and he is the Son of God. The Son of Man meaning that he's the Son of Mary, adopted by Joseph. He's the Son of God because he's the Son of Mary, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit of God, who gave her the Immaculate Conception to where she was able to bring forth a child if she never knew a man. Understand? When we're talking about baptism, we're talking about a couple of different things. Dying to die. Look, look at this word. Look at this word. Dying to die. Dying to die. When I got saved, when you got saved, the old you died. The old James is dead. He's so dead you get a coffin for him. He did. Amen. And I'm not going to resurrect him, and I'm not going to let you resurrect him. 
He did. I told you. See, there are some things that come to resurrect the old man and the old woman. And it's usually what the Bible refers to as familiar spirits. A familiar spirit is something that you are acquainted with. My familiar spirit was lust. As a man, my familiar spirit was lust. But because that old man is dead, your skirt can't get high enough, your blouse can't get low enough to resurrect him. Because I knew the damage that he did to me back then, and there's no way in hell I'm going to let him do it again. Understand? So I'm willing to die, or I'm dying to die. Because it's a, a work every day. Every day, you got to fight. Every day, you got to fight to live holy. Every day, you got to fight to live righteous. Why is that? Because we live in an unrighteous, unholy society. And we're around people who are unrighteous and unholy. And we're bombarded with things that are unrighteous and unholy. So if we, the oldest saints, who have been in this thing for a while, struggling, what do you think our kids going through? What do you think they're going through? Huh? They faced with some demons that we didn't have to face. They, 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 face, they face with some stuff that we can't even begin to imagine. To be baptized means to be immersed. To be immersed. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, when you baptize them, don't you know that the Trinity is unified in agreement to this baptism? Baptizing simply means that you have taken on a new life, a new nature, a new mind, and most of all, a new identity. A new identity. I have a new nature because I don't do what I did before. I'm not talking about the baptism of water. John baptized with water. Okay? I believe it's Mark chapter 20. John says, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But there is one who is coming, who was before me, who comes after me, that I'm not worthy to stoop down and latch up his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. He was talking about Jesus. John the Baptist said, Jesus is coming. He said, I baptize you with water, but there's one who's coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit showed up for Jesus. Because he had to equip Jesus. The Holy Spirit equipped us to do what we're supposed to be doing in the kingdom of God so we can be effective. I know you got problems. Listen, listen, I know you got problems. I know you got deal problems. I know you got relationship problems. I know you got, so you got family problems. I know you got all these issues. We all got issues. Amen. Amen. But none of those issues should trump the calling that God has placed upon your life. In fact, if you turn all the issues over to him and accept the calling, he will take care of the issues. We just got to learn to trust him. So, when John baptized, he baptized in the Jordan River. When Jesus baptized, he baptized with himself. So as a Christian, when you baptize, you've been immersed into a new body, the body of Christ. The word immerse, it, 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 it refers to a, a dying of a garment. To immerse something, the dying of a garment. You, I, I don't know about too, too much today, but when I was growing up and you know, we didn't we weren't into tie-dye too much. But if you got some bleach on your stuff, the best thing to do is just go and die. Okay? And we used to go to the store and uh, we buy some dye and it comes with a little powder or sometimes or something. Sometimes it comes in a pallet. Hey, Amen. You put it in the water and it, it, it gets it turns the color of the water. And then when you put the, the fabric in there, it changes color. This is what your baptism is similar to. Let me show y'all. 
Dus je hebt een aparte suggestie, ik dacht dat ze dat. Maar ik heb een suggestie. Oké. To be baptized is to take on not only the color, but the nature. The properties. Okay? If we've been baptized, immersed into a new body, a new family, a new nature, a new identity, we're going to take on the identity of Jesus Christ. We're going to have the nature of Jesus Christ. We're going to do what Jesus would do. We're going to think like Jesus would think, right? So I would take a red garment, and I want it to be black. So I would put it in the, in the bucket, and while it's soaking, when I pull it out, it's going to come out, it's going to be black. Understand? Because I immersed it in something that was different than what I was. Did I tell you I didn't like me? I didn't like me the way I was. I wanted to be new. So he immersed me into the body of Christ. And now I am a new creature in Christ. Behold, old things have passed away. Now all things have become new. Now I don't even have the, I don't even have the same thoughts that I had back then. I don't, even, I don't even have the same desires that I had back then. Because now I am a new creature in Christ. You understand? Is that simple enough for you? I am a new creature. You are a new creature in Christ. So to be immersed into the body of Christ simply means that I have a whole new family. That's why I call you my brother. That's why I call you my sister. The Bible even tells us how we are to address our new family. The Bible says that I am to treat the older men as fathers. I'm to treat the older women as mothers. I'm to treat the younger men as brothers. And I am to treat the younger women as sisters. And then the Bible says, with all purity. Why did God put that in there? Why is that? He, when, I, when he came to the man, he said, Father, when he came to mother, he said, Mother, when he came to brother, he said, Brother. But when it comes to the women, the younger women, he said, treat them as sisters with all purity because God knows the mind of a man. God knows the mind of a man. So he's reminding us of how we are to interact as a family. Come on now. I got sisters, and I, can't, I, I, I have never in my life ever thought of them in an impure manner. So that's the same attitude I need to take with my younger sisters here. Understand what I'm saying? Why? Because as long as we are a family and we're on one accord, then whatever the cause is, whatever the mission is for this ministry, we can be effective and powerful. But what comes to divide us? Us. What comes to separate us? Us. What I think. What I do. If you take your eyes off the mission and you begin to focus on your flesh, then you're going to always destroy not only yourself, but others too. Come on, man. Oh, Lord, help me, Mr. Pratt. I remember I heard a story about a pastor. He's a, actually he's a bishop in the Church of God of Christ. And, uh, he was struggling, struggling in his ministry, you know, struggling, you know, just trying to keep things going. And he, they had took him up to a pretty high level uh, in the coaching. And one of his deacons, seeing that he was exhausted, seeing that he was struggling, and one of his deacons got him hooked on cocaine. And when this deacon had got him hooked on cocaine, he lost everything. He lost his congregation. He lost his integrity. He lost his family. He lost his ministry. And he almost lost his life. You see, whenever we get focused off of Christ and we be derailed, we not only get destroyed, but we destroy everybody who's attached to us. So that's why we have to die. We have to die. I have to die to self. The Bible says, if you're going to be my disciple, then you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. To deny yourself simply means to die to self. 
to deny yourself. To, to deny yourself so it means that I'm not going to allow myself to be the governing factor in my life. I'm not going to move impulsively. Do you know one of our biggest problems, especially in the urban community? We're impulsive. We're impulsive spenders. African American people make less money than anybody in the entire world, in the entire United States, rather. The African American community. African American women make lower wages than anybody else. Most of them are more educated than a lot of us, but they still make less money. African American male, if he's not incarcerated, he's making less money than his white or counterpart. Okay? But do you know the African American community is the highest consumer? Come on now. We spend more money on more stuff that we don't need. I remember a man was telling, uh, he was an Asian, he was telling uh, his other Asian counterpart how to sell to the urban community. He said, make it shiny. If you want to sell something to the urban community, Make it shine. If you can put some bling on it, they will buy it. And we spend all our effort and all our money, money we don't even have, to buy stuff that we don't even need. That'll probably be in the garbage by next week. Because it was shiny today, but you wore it one time, and now it's clean. Amen. Deny yourself simply means that I'm going to put God first. And I'm going to use God's principles in order to govern my life. All right? If I'm going to use God's principles in order to govern my life, then I'm not getting in the bed with that young man because God's principle says that a fornicator is against God, opposes God. No matter how impulsive I may be, if, if I'm going to use God's principles to govern my life, then I'm not going to be attracted to another man. No matter how impulsive it may be. If I'm going to use the principles of God in order to govern my life, I'm not smoking that, drinking that, putting that in my arm. Because I'm holding on to the principles of God. Why? Why? Because I have been baptized into a new body, and now I have a new nature, and I've taken on the nature of Jesus Christ. Y'all get me? It's all about your baptism. It's not about the baptism with water. To be baptized with water is simply your public identification with Jesus Christ. Being baptized into water is your public identification with your new life. I told you before, you can go home and get saved in your own closet. You can go in your own room, shut the door, ain't nobody got to know. You go in there and say, Lord, I accept my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and help me to live a life that's pleasing unto you from this day forward. And right there and there, you're saved. Okay? And you did that privately. But you got to live it out publicly. You got to live it out publicly. Because I died to the old man. I died to the hidden things. And I don't mind. The Bible says that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, unto the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. Romans 1 1 6. I died. I died. You died. We need to die. We all need to die. And we need to die daily. Daily. Every day we have to die. And sometimes I know you get tired of dying. Don't you get exhausted sometimes? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like it ain't doing no good. Uh -huh. you know, Lord, where you at? Why do I got to face this again? Don't nothing ever work out for me. I'm just sick of dying. But the Bible warns us. God says, weary not in well-doing. For you shall reap a heart. If you faint not, you can't give up. You can't give out 
and you certainly can't get in. Amen. My God, when the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. Jesus was baptized. Jesus had to be baptized in order to start his ministry. Now that Jesus has been baptized, he baptized us with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when Jesus, after he had ascended up out of the grave, the Bible said that the apostles were all gathered together in one place in an upper room for fear of the Jews. Jesus been killed, and they feared they're going to be next. So they hid themselves in the upper room. And the Bible said, and they hid themselves up there, and they locked the door. And when they locked the door, all of a sudden, the resurrected Christ shows up. Did nobody open the door for him? He didn't open the door for himself. He just appeared. And when he appeared, Jesus said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said he breathed on them. He didn't stick them down in the water. Come on now. He didn't immerse them in the water. They were immersed into the body of Christ. So he imparted himself the Spirit of God. He imparted himself unto his disciples so that they could do what he told them to do in Matthew chapter 28. Go ye and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all things that I have taught you. He breathed on them. See, we have all these different facets in our mind from our you know, inerrant teaching in the past about how the Holy Spirit works. Some people say, well, it, it, unless you speak in tongues, you ain't got the Holy Spirit. But I beg to differ because I've seen some powerful people in the kingdom of God who don't speak in tongues. So how do you explain that? Well, they want to take it from the book of Acts chapter 2. When you call in tongues, the fire set up on each one of them. And they begin to speak in tongues. Well, you got to go back and you got to study the scripture. The scripture says that in the book of Acts chapter 2 that people were from all other nations. So everybody there didn't speak Hebrew or Greek. So God anointed them with the Holy Spirit and had them to be able to communicate the wonders of God to folks who didn't speak their language. Hello, y'all understand that? So they were speaking in unknown tongues. They were unknown to them, but they weren't unknown to the people they were speaking to. Because the people they were speaking to, they later said in the same book, Acts chapter 2, they said, are not all these men Galileans, yet we hear them in our native land? They're all Galileans, but yet they're speaking to us in our native language. We understand what they're saying. Come on, now how is that possible? The Holy Spirit. Okay? But if we go back and we start going back with, with what we've been taught in the past that unless you speak in the tongues, unless you work for this thing, then you can't have the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit. God didn't put no down payment on you. He gave you his spirit. He imparted his spirit to you. If that was the case, then that meant that you can't get the rest of it to lay on. He gave you his spirit. You got to understand the difference. Now, okay. There is the impartation of the spirit or the indwelling of the spirit. And there's the baptism of the spirit. And then there's being filled with the spirit. Okay. When you are filled with the spirit, then that is the Holy Spirit coming in you to empower you. To enable you to do what it is that you're supposed to do. When you're indwelled with the Spirit, then that's saying that the Spirit has came and taken up residence in you. Okay? Don't miss this. Don't miss this. So, if I'm indwelled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit now lives on the inside of me. This is the Holy Spirit's house. Your body is not your own. You've been bought with a price. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit lives in me. 
Now I am filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that I can't do what God called me to do until I get filled with the Holy Spirit. Guess what I got filled? He says, do not be drunk in wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. How? By singing songs of melody, by singing uh, hymns to yourself, by making sweet melody in your heart to God. He said, that's how you get filled with the Spirit, okay? And then to be baptized with the Spirit means that I've been placed into a new family, into a new nature, into a new body. I've been immersed. And guess what? It all happened simultaneously the moment I surrendered my life to Christ. All of it. It all happened just like this. I bought a new, when I retired, I bought a brand new car. I bought a new car for me and I bought a new car for my wife. Okay? When we bought the new car and they brought them around, they both had full tanks. But that full tank that they gave when I drove them off the lot didn't last. I had to go back and get some more. And get some more. And get some more. That's why we're in the body of Christ. That's why we're in church. So, because what you got at your salvation is a never ending supply. And you gotta keep going back. You gotta keep going back. You gotta keep going back. Not to get the Holy Spirit, but to get your assignment. To get that power so that you can do what you need to do. Understand? That's why we all call. Go ye into all the land, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can't do that until you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Y'all get that? You have to have the Holy Spirit. Meaning that when you got baptized into the body of Christ, it was not by water, but by the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God that baptized us. That gave us a new nature. I took on the properties of Christ, the mind of Christ. I think like Christ. Not all the time, but I worked on it. Don't you work on it? It's hard sometimes. Man, because I be want what I want when I want it, the way I want it. It's my money and I want it now. <laughs> I don't want to wait. I want it now. Amen. But if you wait on God, uh -huh. he's going to give you so much more. Yeah. But sometimes it feels like you just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and God just ain't showed up. He going to show up. Trust me, he going to show up. Uh -huh. Amen. I got a lot more for this lesson, so I, don't, don't be surprised. You see this again next time because uh, I ain't even got to uh, the third of it yet. Amen. Because yeah. I, I don't want to leave you in limbo. Uh -huh. Amen. And this is just an introduction. I don't want to leave you in limbo concerning baptism. Amen. And I know that we've had some teaching about baptism in the past. But I want to show you in the scriptures what God says concerning your baptism and mine. The Bible says that there's one faith, one hope, and one baptism. One. Amen. One. Amen. Amen. You got something to work on? Put your hands together. You got something. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the patience of your people, Lord. We thank you for your precious Holy Spirit, Lord. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching us, oh God, how to operate in your word. Now, Father, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you continue to open up our understanding, Lord Jesus. Let us walk in your word. Don't let us just be hearers of your word, but let us be doers of your word. And Lord, we'll give you the glory, the honor, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, one more time. Give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know if you look at your uh, uh, your announcements, but uh, I'm going to uh, roll some announcements for you when we're done. But just in case uh, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just want to give you the opportunity right now to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Meaning that if you are a sinner and you want to be saved, all you have to do is just say this simple little prayer but you must mean it for yourself and it must come from your heart and it must be a confession made from your lips that Lord, I am a sinner and I want to be saved. I need to be saved. I believe that you died upon the cross for all of my sins. I believe that three days in the grave you got up 
and declare all power was yours in heaven and on earth, and that you have redeemed me from my sins. I receive it. I accept it. Now, Lord, come into my heart. Help me to live a life that is pleasing unto you from this day forward. I thank you for the gift of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, those of you who are viewing out there on our Facebook page, on our YouTube, I just want to let you know that if you said that prayer for the first time, that you're saved and there's nothing anyone can do to make you unsaved, and I want to be the first to welcome you to the family of God. God bless you. Hope to see you again next Sunday right here at Heaven's Day Church at 11 a.m. Bye-bye for now.